for all you grand uppers out there, this podcast is for you. <laughs> this is the Fan of Fan podcast, and I'm Topless, and for all you ground uppers out there, this podcast is for you. An unusual episode tonight as I'm on my own, but the show must go on, and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by a lifelong Celtic fan and one of South Yorkshire's biggest Celtic fans. It's Jim. How are you, mate? Evening, Jake. Evening. Evening, everybody. Yeah, good to have you on, mate. Thank you for coming on at sh such short notice. No problem. No problem, yeah. So, Jim Mitchell from Glasgow. Big Celtic fan. Tell us your background in football. How did you get into football? Uh, into football, I suppose, when you're born in Glasgow. It's... Um, you're born with a football at your foot, basically. In the early 60s, it was just, that was everything anybody wanted to do. That that was it. And I was just always football mad for you. I was a kid. Um, for you, probably I could walk. Um, for you, I went to school. Went to school with a football under my arm. Kicked it about at dinner time. Kicked it about at tea time. Kicked it about all night till it was dark. My mother got me out of the house. Woke up in the morning took a football to school, and that lasted for <laughs> a long time. And then when I was eight or nine, I got into playing football at school. Um, and I was actually not bad at it, <laughs> to be fair. Um, maybe that was three stone ago, but bear in mind, I'm nearly 60 years of age now. Um, however, I started playing school football, and then I started playing for couple of clubs in Glasgow and then I moved on to playing Scottish amateur football and then when I was 14, 15 I was lucky enough to um, go down to Coventry City for a couple of years on trials and up and down there and played some games and stuff like that and um, unfortunately it never worked out for me um, however I then went back playing in Glasgow and uh, I went back to a team I was originally playing for and they were a, what you would probably call a nursery side. Is that the right word to call it for it's some of the bigger club? Side. Yeah, that's what they called it there. And yeah. The lads maybe went on and played. So they still had the ties with Coventry City and Norwich. Um, but they also played, funnily enough, uh, they also played under a, I would say a Coventry City banner, as in, although with Glasgow, um, they used to get invited to play in big tournaments uh, in, the, in the States, um, in Germany, places like that. And um, I was lucky enough to play against a load of these clubs like Malmo, Eintracht Frankfurt, um, Manchester City, loads, loads, great experiences, um, great, great games. And that was even back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, as I say. Unfortunately for me, it didn't work out as I wanted it to. I just wanted to be a professional footballer. Um, maybe I don't know if you've got many older listeners, but maybe some if they ask their dads. Obviously, non-league football um, is very difficult. It's a different fo football is a different game today as it was then. I.e., if you're sticking a lad at 17, 18, 19 in to play against men that have played maybe been playing, I don't know, first division, second division, third division football, and they've wrapped down to non-league, maybe late 30s, mid 30s, and they're absolutely bossing lads about. And I don't mean it in a, a good way. I mean, belting into them, where you could tackle for the back, um, boots were flying in, and you know what? It wasn't for me. I, I just thought, you know what? Um, I had enough. However, in seeing all that, if you don't pick up any injuries, you could probably carry on. It's a different type of game today, as I say. Yeah. But I, I tell you what, it, it was a good learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the best way I can put it? But uh, as I say, I had a, a lot of great times, met, met a lot of great lads, played with a lot of great lads as well. I'm not going to really name drop on this because it's not about that. Um, that might be for another, another time. And I'll tell you lads I played with and uh, lads that I, I grew up with and you'll, you'll, a lot of your 
people, the lads that listen to your show, they might not know them, but certainly their fathers will know them um, and stuff like that. But I, I played with some really, really great players and uh, had some great, fantastic times. I, I, can't, I can't say I didn't. Also, if you can back to like, school football, it's very, very difficult for schools to produce players. Um, and, I, and I went to a school where if you got one lad out of, out of that school in a four-year spell to become a professional, and I don't mean like going to Manchester United or Arsenal or Celtic. Um, I, I mean like maybe going to a, a, which is now a championship side in England, which is now the second division, or a, a, a lower side, uh, a lower side, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe dropping down a couple of leagues. But we certainly had a great turnout, Runa. Uh, even at, when I was at school, see, for the four years at secondary school, I can name you 12 guys that all went on to have successful careers at, at, at good clubs, i.e., Celtic, St. Mern, um Newcastle United, places like that. And that's, that's no mean feat. I mean, you, you probably see Ali McCoy on the telly all the time. I mean, he he done, as much as I don't want to talk about the Angels, but it's just that I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to explain that the, the abundance of players that, that came through the Glasgow football, Scottish football, especially through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. And I, I, has it died away a wee bit? Probably, but it's probably died away in the UK in a whole, there's a lot of kids, they've got more options now. And I don't mean more options in life. I mean, they've got more options in their spare time. A lot of them don't want to play football. Some of them are quite content to play Game Boys, I don't know, or the computer stuff, or the other sports, cycling, um, boxing is a, was a big thing when I was, at, when I was growing up as well. I was never really into it. A couple of my pals, well, one of them done really well. As I say, we can we can have names another night, but that's really an insight into me. But um, as I say, I still played football, even though I didn't get to where I always dreamed of being, the same as everybody else. But I certainly had good opportunities and uh, played with some fabulous players. And it, it was just great to, to play on real grass parks and um, be proper stadia and all that to get away from playing like I mean I grew up in Glasgow some of the pitches my god <laughs> uh, <laughs> listen they would have, they would have been close see the health and safety today they wouldn't have allowed kids to play football in them is that the best way I can sum that 100, up 100% I don't think you could have put any better than that mate but to yeah. And that's I know that's not to say avoiding avoiding people throwing cider bottles not at you at the touchline when you're 15 years of age because you're <laughs> playing in another part of the city and you don't want your team to win. <laughs> but my God, it was an experience. Put it that way. <laughs> so wow, we, we we obviously me and Jack, as you know, Callum McGregor know you was the big Celtic fan, but we don't know he was the player. But uh, getting get into football, what what position did you play? What was your oh, best position? Uh, well, you know what? I was very versatile. Where okay. I always wanted... I, I, I played left-back at school, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and funny enough, I'd I, I done that for a long time. I liked to be in the middle of the park, but I found that left-back, I was pretty good at it. But you know what? I, I also played centre-forward. Now, I know that's, a, that's a, a thing where people would say... Um, Oh, how can you go for left back to centre forward? But it was a case of if you just turned up on a Saturday and there was only 14 guys or whatever, and somebody, I don't know, didn't they turn up one day? So they say, Oh, you just play up there today, and then you just take to it. But sometimes I think if if you can think about playing at defence and then playing forward, you have an idea of how the defenders are thinking. But obviously, it was a more physical game when I played. You know what I mean? It was like very yeah. physical. But you know what else I know? I love to be the goalie. I, I used to love that. So it was one of them. And you know the funny thing is, you know uh, Harry Kane, he, he's fantastic, scores goals every week. 
Did you know that he's a brilliant goalkeeper as well? <laughs> I, I didn't know that, to be fair. I mean, we obviously know him as the goal scorer, but, I mean, goalkeeping, it's not for everybody. I mean, I, I'll personally, no. I, I, used to, I used to not mind going in goal. But one thing I did mind in PE was going in goal at 11 aside because I was always bad at full-size nets. But, at like, you know, five aside in the hockey sort of nets, I'd be fine. I'd be like, yeah, put me in net, I'll do it. And I'd do it again in this day and age if I got, you know, in, like, you know, in futsal. I'd be like, yeah, I'll go in yeah. goal. Thank you very much. See you. I, I suppose it's a, it's a different... They're, they're two different games. Yeah. They're, they're, I know that they're both so, football. They're two different games. It's like playing tennis and playing doubles. It's a massive yeah. difference. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, like you say, with yeah. the, the defensive side of the game back in your day compared to this day and age, like, I'm sure coaches would have preferred the defenders just to get the ball away from the goal, whereas this day and age, you've got to play it out. <laughs> you know, Pep Guardiola sort of way. Whereas yeah. strikers yeah, well, always had the same sort of thing, hasn't it, really? Yeah. There was times that the, the midfield did get miss, missed out, but and saying that, people people wanted to play football. I understand that the, the physicalities here were massive then, where you, well, you barged through the back, bang into people. There was nearly like yellow cards for that. You, you, you literally had to be side somebody at waist height to, to get a yellow card. To get, to, get, to get a red card, it had to be GBH. <laughs> 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 well, I just want to put in there, like, I'm sure there's one player that comes to mind when we're talking about this, and that is Vinny Jones. <laughs> now, I show, I, I've watched yeah. the video, the compilation of tackles back in the, the early days of the Premier League. I showed it to me, Dan and my brothers, and we all laughed. They, they weren't red cards back then. In this day and age, I'm telling you now, mate, every single one would have been a red card in this day and age. <laughs> I'll tell you a scenario, right? You know, you're talking about that situation. If you ever watch the 1986 World Cup in Mexico when England played Argentina, seen the first 20 minutes of that game, see if that game was today, three England players would have had red cards for the assaults in Diego Maradona. Wow. If you, if you watch it, that, I say the assaults, because that's what they were. <laughs> yeah. I'm they sure Stuart Pearce might have been one of them. England went out just to let, um, blitz them. And to be fair to the wee guy, he got up and he bounced up and he got on me up. But three, three of them were diabolical. It was absolutely horrendous. But that was the way it was. And could you imagine how bad it must have been in 66 when England played Argentina when Alf Ramsey called them animals, right? And then in 67, when Celtic played Racing Club Argentina in the World Club Championship final, it was called the Battle of Montevideo. And it wasn't called that for nothing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, 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 I mean, let's be right about it. You, you don't mind a bit of physicality about the game and getting charged in and that. But no. is, is it better? It probably is better today. My own, my own grievances with the modern technology, they're no using it the correct way. No, but absolutely hey, not. That's modern football for you. Well, I mean, I don't want to get yeah. too controversial, but I've just watched Arsenal Leicester and seen that penalty given, and I'm thinking, oh, dear me, that is not a penalty. But to, in terms of, like, you know, as a fan as well, sitting in the stands, you don't half love it when you defend it. Centre-half clatters and gets the ball at the striker. You're like, come on, you know, you love that sort of thing. And that's... Why I love non-league yeah. football so much. Yeah, and that's that's what that's that's what people want to go and see that. They want that. They they don't want somebody like getting touched like Neymar and rolling rolling yeah. twelve yards across the pitch, hold, holding his leg as if he's been hit with a train, and then spends three or four minutes doing the ground. Next minute he's up and he's away. No, unfortunately, there's a lot of players like that today. Um, is it cheating? Mm. Debatable, isn't it? Really? Is it part of modern game? The only, the only thing for me, as far as I can see, man, much as Jurgen Klinsmann was a fantastic player, one of the most decorated football players in world football, he brought that to the English game. Yeah, that's only my opinion. 
he brought that to the English game. That mm-hmm. uh, that getting touched and rolling about, and he was a big lad as well. There was no need for that. But however, he scored some goals and he was a brilliant player. But it seems to have just caught on. It's even in, it's even in other sports now. Even rugby, you see people that feign an injury. Even if you go into the GEA games, I don't know if you watch much GEA stuff, the Gaelic games. You've, you've even, you never had it in Gaelic football, and it's crept into that the last few years as well, people feigning an injury. Uh, and try to get other people sent off and get them yellow cards. But unfortunately, that's just the way sport has went today, I think, particularly in the football. Yeah, it's a shame they don't use their abilities to their advantage rather than, you know, playing on the officials. It's not just it's not just Neymar, like you say. Gareth Bale had it for a long time. There's uh, me watching him in a red shirt, Luis Suarez for a long time as well. There's, there's you know, obviously Ronaldo a few times. Yeah, listen, more. the list is the list is endless. Yeah, <laughs> the idea all through the idea through the football, Scotland, England, probably it's all over Europe. Let's be right about yeah. it. And unfortunately, it spoils it spoils it for the fans yeah. and. There's that much money involved today, and there's that much um, there's that much at stake for some of these that it's a win by any means. And I see all I say it's it's no rights to get another professional sent off and all that. Do you think yeah. their manager's worrying about that when he's got when his job's on the line and he's no one three games out of three, and all of a sudden he thinks his player can get a guy sent off and they can win that game? You might come on the TV and tell you a different story. But deep down, he's like, ah, good, he get off and we won one now. But that's it, I suppose. It's all about winning. It is, mate, yeah. And like you say, you much prefer for the pundits' analysis to be talking about the brilliance of somebody's performance rather than he cheated to get a penalty. You know what I mean? It, well, it, it certainly... There, there's, a, there's another thing. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we hardly ever knew who the referee was. It was just a bloke in the middle. Now the referees are turned into celebrities. Ever since um, Kalina came onto the scene and Channel 5 started showing you the Italian games, Kalina became a celebrity referee and then you've you've got them all. They all want to be recognised in the street and put their names up there. Which, to me, see if you're the referee and nobody knows who you are and you go off the pitch, you've had a good game. But when everybody starts talking about you and saying, oh, him, him, that's no right. The, the, the game's about the players yeah. and the, the fans. The game's no about the referee. Ah, he's part of the game, but he's not the star. And some of them want to be the star of the show. No, you're absolutely right there, mate. I mean, I, I, I would mention the uh, the Chelsea-Barcelona referee in 2009, but I, I can just to touch on that point, I can remember years ago, we were in the Traffic Centre, and my dad uh, saw Graham Polk. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm probably sure what you know what's coming, but dad went up to him like that. And Graham Paul just looked away, didn't, didn't acknowledge him. My dad said he probably felt felt like punching him, but you're right, yeah, re- referees. I mean, I, I, I coach at grassroots level in junior football and I've, I've had it where referees have been talking to players and the coaches, including me, have shouted, it's not all about you, ref, get on with the game. And you're absolutely yeah. right. Some referees do like to be... You know, yeah. and I can remember, you know, last season as well. Do you remember Marine, that non-league club in Liverpool playing Tottenham in the yeah, FA Cup? Yeah, yeah. And they, they, they got Michael Oliver to referee it. And somebody put on social media, why didn't you get a local referee to do it? Why didn't you get one of the Northern West Counties referees to do it? Yeah, that would have added to it a little bit. Because you've turned the referees into celebrities. Yeah, It's ridiculous. Absolutely. It's ridiculous that the referee, um, I mean, they brought in professional referees, right? Because they felt it was it was needed. Yeah. Bringing professional referees, but it doesn't make them any better at the at doing the job. No. But but don't even get me on to VAR. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> Do not. Especially not after today, mate. No, we'll, we'll, we'll cut VAR. But, but like I say, with referees. We'll, talk about VAR. <laughs> but we'll just we'll just keep to the to the beautiful game itself and the yeah. great players we've seen and and the, the fantastic memories it gives you yeah. because if you start talking about the negative side you'd probably want to go back to your game 
Yeah, well, the uh, lad VAR has finished for this chat, but uh, let's touch on Coventry City then. So the late 70s, early 80s, you had your into Coventry City. So Coventry City at the time are probably in the top division, I believe. They, they were always historically yeah, that, a really big club. You know, what was it like? You know what? It was absolutely fantastic. They had Gordon Milne was the manager at the time he was there. And they had such a good squad, um, a good players. Um, they had Dean Wallace, they uh, went on to play f f at Nottingham Forest. Um, Dave Cross, um, Jim Blythe was a goalkeeper, he was a Scotland goalie. And um, Terry Yoroff was the captain of the first team. And Terry Yoroff had this reputation because he played for Leeds United. Um, and you know what? What a, what a, a great man he was. I was I say he's a man. He was probably, when I was only 14, 15, 16, whatever. You know what I mean? And you're, you're doing for the Easter holidays and all that stuff and everything else. And um, honest to God, it couldn't have been any nicer to, to the young lads. Because, I mean, he was a captain and first team man. They were doing pretty well in the English first old first division. You know what I mean? But he always yeah. made sure he came and spoke to everybody. Same with Jim Blythe, the goalkeeper. I knew there was a couple of lads down for Scotland and that. Come here, how he's doing, what he's up to. Hope he's hope he's got on all right and all that. And made sure that it made time for us, you know. And it was, uh, aye, great. A great experience. And also, I know, the facilities at, at the time at their training were as was probably at second to none. I spoke to some other lads that had been at other clubs and that, and he says, oh, it wasn't here what we thought it was going to be, but it was great. And uh, listen, see when you're that age and you're a teenager and you're, you're getting this stuff and you think to yourself, this is magic. You, you go and yeah, you go to play football in the morning. And as we Bertie Old, one of the Lisbon Lions says, you train all week and you get a day off on Saturday to play football. That's what it was like. It was great. Fabulous. But it doesn't work out for everybody and everybody just doesn't get the, the chances or they might, somebody might not think that they're just good enough for that and they go and boy, she's good doing. Today, it's a, it's a different scenario. We never had any, there was no like, academies or anything like that and any of, the stu any of the modern stuff you've got. You were just a kid that he's went, a, a gang of you's went and uh, took your chances or gave it your shot, hoped how it would work out. Some guys got on, some guys drifted away, went and played sort of non-league or dropped in divisions or whatever. Some guys just thought, you know what, I'll just kind of no bother anymore. Also, the, the financial side of football today is... The, the, the rewards are absolutely fantastic. They're fantastic. Um, and I remember when... Because uh, I, I went to the same school as Charlie Nicholas. And when Charlie was at the Celtic, and he was there 100 quid a week at the Celtic, Arsenal came in 300 quid a week, went to Arsenal. I remember when Luther Blissett was at Watford, and he was in £150, I think, a week or 200 quid a week at Watford. And he went to AC Milan and he couldn't believe it. Thought he'd hit a jackpot. 500 quid a week at AC Milan. You know what I mean? You look at it today, Sky TV came in and just... Have you the money, boys. Like, enjoy. <laughs> yeah, the, the, money, the money just went through the ceiling and it just... It completely changed the outlook of a British football, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Because it, it was the, the money wasn't shared. It was just poured into the EPL with they set up. I, I know that the, the English Championship teams get a massive amount of money for getting relegated. What's that about? Yeah. Rewarding for failure. However, yeah. that's, another, that's another story for another day. But that, that was the beginning of the end for the, for the level playing field between the Scottish clubs and English clubs. Simply because Celtic and the others could compete on the on the playing field easily with the with the top English clubs. You just need to look back, look in YouTube and see some of the old games or just look at the results and look at how it went. 
even you look at the Scotland England games through the sixties, seventies, even into the eighties, they were they were much eachy peachy, and the players, everybody knew the players, and they all played with each other and, and club sides. Today, it's just it's been destroyed. And my my argument about this is, if you live in Aberdeen or Edinburgh, or Glasgow, and you live in don't know Bournemouth, Manchester, Sheffield, Rotherham, wherever, and you pay your twenty quid a week or whatever your subscription is to Sky, that money should be split around the UK at the clubs, no just no just a, a cash cow to the EPL. But unfortunately, nobody listens to me. Split split to more than 92, the whole football league. I, I think I think the money should be shared all through. As I say, if you if you're paying your your Sky subscription and you live in Aberdeen or Glasgow and you live in Bournemouth or Rotherham, that money should be that money should be spread through because it's not as if they're not showing the games. They're showing the games and people are subscribing to them. So mm. I think that the money should be shared through the, the, the football We all the teams. But then again, they don't want to do that, do they? Do do, mate? Honestly, I mean, oh. for me, obviously, saying I'm a Liverpool fan, as a kid, I'm also a big follower of my Lope, where I'm originally from, Mansfield Town in League Two. Yeah. And I mean, I've watched him over the years, especially obviously Friday night when we lost to Tramby. It was still a good game. Sky Sports don't know what they're missing. When I go to some of these away games, honestly, I'm thinking if Sky Sports had that, they'd be laughing and the fans would be delighted. They'd be calling for, you know, let's have more League Two on there. So I think, yeah. yeah, obviously, like you say, being a rewarder for failure, you're too right there. Yeah. If you have a look, look at look at the championship. Fulham and Bournemouth, who came down last season, what was it the year before? We'll I can't remember. They come, they come in down, and look at them, they're, they're back up there, just like that. And you, you probably yeah. get one one surprise a year in the championship, don't you? Really, one team's yeah. not been there for a while, like like a Brentford. I mean, this yeah. year it could be it could be Forest this year, for example. You never know. Could be. Yeah. Who else is there? I mean, Sheffield United are there. They were down last season. But you've, yeah. you, you do, you know, it could be Huddersfield. But again, they were only recently down. QPR, been a couple of years. Yeah. I can't think who else is down. But you, then, you get it rarely, then, don't you? And then you could look at the other side of the coin where also where, where teams that just completely overspent and overspent and overspent chasing that holy grail a Champions League football. Look what happened to them. Leeds United. 16 yeah. year old. Shouting Athletic. They were they were consolidated in the Premier League for a long time, I think it's they're, six year. And then they just fell down. And then they went and they went down and down and down. Wolverhampton Wanderers. They 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 struggled for years and years to get out of that. Then they, they finally got out and then they went back down. And they're just a team that bobbles about as well. Aye, they might have a good season in it, but you know what? Then somebody will come in and cherry pick two or three of their players. Before they know it, they're in a dogfight at the bottom. And if they go down and then they've got to sell maybe three or four of others, then you can end up in that League One again like Sheffield Wednesday and you never come back. It's easy to be done. You know what I mean? It's yeah, easy to be done. I mean, I well, remember when, when Wednesday were up there and they had people at the Canio and Carboni and all that. Did they ever think they were going to spend all this time in the third division English football? No, because they thought that they were, well, well, Wednesday we'll be back up, we'll be back in the, the Premier League. You've got to earn it and you've got to run the club on an even keel. Aye, you've got to spend money, but you've got to, you've got to have a wee bit of luck and you need yeah. to try and get the players in and get the job done. And unfortunately, Trump and changing your manager every every six games doesn't he work. No, definitely doesn't, mate. Yeah. And uh, I just want to touch on Charlton there, like you say, like they were a make stay in the Premier League, top half, mid table finish every season. And then there yeah. was murmurings that uh, the chairman wanted Alan Kirbisley out so he could progress the club. Alan Kirbisley leaves, and two two or three years later, they're in League One. Yeah, nice. I, I, I can remember as well. You're Coventry Gordon. City went yeah. got relegated Gordon. from the Prem. Gordon, Gordon Stratton kept them up for years and done a great yeah. job. 2001 they went down I can remember there was a yeah. fan in the crowd with a sign saying we'll be back Yeah. well they haven't been back it's been 20 years yeah. now <laughs> Leeds United were the same when Alan Smith went to Manchester United I'll be yeah. back and we're playing in the Premier League 
he came and went. His career ended. Sixteen years leads were away. Yeah, that's, that's the way it goes. It is you, you need to. It, it's so difficult, especially the, the day with the with the media, the hype, the Sky TV, any the, the just the whole thing, the internet, everything, the everything scrutinised. Everything is absolutely scrutinised. The players can't do nothing, or the club can't do nothing without somebody being on it and watching it and reporting back. You know, but anyway, that's the way it goes. But uh, football, it's still the same game. It's changed, but it's still the same game. Get a ball apart and score a goal. <laughs> that's what it's all about. And it still gives us fans absolute pleasure as well. At times, it, can, it, it still does. it still can make us cry, you know. <laughs> of course, it does. Listen, you don't think I get in my bed at, at six o'clock on a Saturday morning to make a two hundred fifty mile trip up the road because I don't want to. I do it because I love the club and I want to see them do well. And I, I I just I love football anyway. Yeah, but I love Celtic. Yeah, and it's just, let, let, just let, me. Let's... <laughs> Yeah, let's let's move on to Celtic then. So massive Celtic fan. How how did the love for Celtic start for you? Do you know what? It, it, it's a it's a strange thing. This well, it's no, but it is. It was never, it was never really in my house uh, as in, um, like the football. But I've got a big family, me, and a lot of them are massive Celtic. And I suppose when you grow up in Glasgow, um, especially when I did in the 60s and the 70s and uh, I don't really like to say this but you go to a Catholic school Celtic's the team no, and I know you don't want to get into the, 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 the divide but it's probably the way it is the way it is there's no way any dressing it up so but I was also I was also lucky enough to be to be born at a time when Scottish football was in a massive high. Like, Rangers had been in the European Cup, Winners' Cup final. Celtic had been in the European Cup final and they won it. And I was a kid. Even Dunfermline got to the first city semi-final. Um, then three years later, when Celtic had done the nine in a row in, in the 60s and 70s, and they went to another European Cup final that they lost an extra time to Fiernord in 1970 in the San Siro. And then in 74, 72, they played Inter Milan again, who they had previously beat five years before in the final European Cup. They lost the semi-final and penalty kicks to them. And then in 74, they played Atletico Madrid and they lost that um, semi-final. But growing up in Glasgow then, Celtic, well, they were, if you take that, that six or seven year through that spell as a kid, they were, they were arguably the greatest. They were the greatest team in Europe, right? Whatever way people want to look at it, for that consistency and doing what they done, you know, when Jock's team was the manager and the players they had were just phenomenal. Obviously, they couldn't have the players of the day because people would just come in and buy them right away. But to grow up in that city and Celtic were there, and, and I just the shot, the green and white shot, and everything, and I just, I just. Celtic was my team. Um, obviously, if, I mean, if you just need to ask some of the guys when, if you, when they came in, the Rotherham Celtic supporters, some of them have got near affiliation to Glasgow. But if you say, you know, how come you're a Celtic man? They went, well, when I was a wee boy, I seen the European Cup final and I seen Celtic win it. And I just thought, you know what? I'm, go I'm going to go and see them. Obviously, years go on and people it's like everything you, you get people that go and see certain teams because they're successful and then they drift away from them but some of the guys that come in to our club they've been gone 50 years and they've, they've never wavered for it and they've not got any associations to Glasgow or Celtic or Ireland or whatever you want to call it through the through the, the Celtic football club but they just adopted the club as their team and they've always went obviously you know some of them so it's just it was just it was magical. But as I say, a lot of my family were massive Celtic fans. One of my grands, one of my grandparents, my, see my my grandmother, my dad's side, she was massive Celtic. 
massive. It was unbelievable. She used to talk to me about players that all played for Celtic in the 40s and the 50s and tell you about Jimmy McGrory and you know, Jimmy McGrory gets a mention in Pelly's book, how he scored the 550 wow. goals in his career. And Pelly said when he knew that McGrory had done that, that he thought, that's my, that's what I want to do. I want to try and beat Jimmy McGrory's record. But as, as I say, it's back to that. It's, Celtic is, for where it started from, to where it is today, started as a, it started as a club to just feed the unemployed and the, and the people that were absolutely on their backsides that came off to Ireland and the east end of Glasgow. It was just to help them out. And it just grew, and it just grew, and it grew. And it's one of the biggest clubs in the world. And it's still great to go every time you go to Celtic Park. If you ever lose that buzz and you keep walk up and you think, even if I drive by, it's not a match day, and you see that stadium, just with that big massive sign right around it, it just says paradise. It just it just pulls you in. So that that's me. And Celtic's always been my team. And I love it. <laughs> and I've been all over them as well. I don't go so much to Europe now, no, but I've done loads of trips to Europe and and I've done them before you got all these um you got all these um flights and all that. I've done like five days in a bus, two days there, an overnight stay some dodgy place and two days back again. <laughs> a week to go and watch one game to get beat and come home again. <laughs> but listen, as I say, a lot some of the guys I, I grew up with, they we went everywhere. Unfortunately some of them have passed away now and stuff, but the memories and the the, the, the laughs and and some of them know so much laughs I know when you're in one of these foreign countries and they're not very hospitable. But anyway, I love to tell the tale. So it's it's been marvellous. And I've even I've even done that with the with the flights now myself a couple of days away and it's much better than doing a bus. Two days to Dortmund and a bus. Who wants to do that nowadays? <laughs> You'd just rather jump the plane two hours and you're in limp and you two two hours if you're looking and you're in Lisbon and the sun's on your back and you can yeah. watch the game at, at Benfica or Sport in Lisbon or Munich or wherever you're going and it's marvellous. And and you know what? Celtic's actually got no bad name with the fans with a lot of the other clubs in Europe. There's, yeah. there's very, very, rarely any trouble. You always get the odd bit, but on a, on a, on a whole, it, it's always been all right. I've never had much much aggravation, only maybe Ajax, but again, they just, they're just one of the clubs that have picked up the last 20 years, picked up a lot of people that want to follow them and just cause aggravation, and I don't, I don't get it myself, you want to go for a few days, have a sing song, have a booze, come home, go to the match, some people just spoil it for everybody, Yeah, but that would be not, so that's, but as I say, um, Plodding along to living here and joining the club in Rotherham. We still got up regular to Celtic Park. I don't do the day trips anymore. I'm too old for that. I like to stay the night now. Have a wee night out in Glasgow, a few beers, and head back down the road on a Sunday. But uh, ah, it's all good. All good. I'll probably keep doing it until I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fantastic to hear that, mate. Just before I touch on to some of your European trips and grounds that you may have visited, I wanted just to, if you can describe the feeling that you felt when your very first day that you stepped into Celtic Park, on that very first game, if you can remember it, what was it like? Well, do you know what? I, I can remember. I can remember. Uh, I'll tell you how this, this may, um See, my very, very first Celtic game, right? Um, it was against Rangers and it was at Ibrox straight into action <laughs> it was at Ibrox it was at Ibrox Park Celtic were away that day and it was a New Year's Day game which was traditionally the the, the Celtic Rangers game on a New Year's Day anyway I was in the intention I was only about nine or something nine or something or ten or something at the time and because uh, my mother was like oh you can't go to that anyway my, my, my old fellow he was 
he was gone. He had some tickets for it, and whoever was gone didn't they turn up. So he said to my mother, oh, I'll take Jim for the match. She went, oh, no, no. Bearing in mind, it would have been like maybe about 70,000 people at Ibrox that day, and it's New Year's Day. Can you imagine the amount of alcohol that was consumed that night? Oh, yeah. So anyway, we went, and uh, Rangers won 1-0. And I thought, <laughs> but um, I had been to the, the first the first game that I'd been at Celtic Park was against Hearts, and uh, it was just because you you didn't have really live games on TV and you know, all that kind of stuff, and you just watched to watch not midweek match match of the day and night the, the European games and all that stuff and get the highlights on a Wednesday night because it was always Wednesdays and uh, the first day I went they were playing hearts at Celtic Park man I was only a kid and I just thought look at this this is this is amazing in a way and you just used to see the jungle at Celtic Park which is it's like the enclosure because obviously like, the cop at Anfield is behind the goal well Celtics was Although they were behind the goal, you had the Celtic end of the stadium, and they all used to call the other end the Rangers end, although it was only just the names. But they had the jungle at Celtic, and the first time when I, I seen it, I thought, oh, it must be brilliant to be in there. So anyway, I went loads of times and all that. But as I say, I was I was wanting to play football myself and all that. So as obviously, you have that spell. We you try and go to like midweek European games or whatever you're doing. But when I got to an age where I wasn't really playing anymore and I moved into the, to stand in the jungle myself and the amount of people that I used to see and used to meet and guys who used to bump into and uh, the European trips away, um, unbelievable. But just to, and you know what? 50 years later, I still walk into Celtic Park and I still think it's great to be here. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's just fantastic. I know the stadium's all changed and it's a big modern stadium now and it's all seated and it's got everything else. But you still walk up the same streets and you still go in the same area. Okay, some of the pubs have changed and things have changed, but one thing never changes. The fans never change and the club never changes. The players might change, the managers might change, but the club and the fans will always be there. They're always the same. And you see guys that you've no seen and for years bump into them and they've got lads with them and then they've got grandkids with them now and all and you think, my God, is this our life? We've all managed to get through life and things have changed. Jobs have went, jobs have gone, wives have gone, whatever. But the football club, their team's always been there. <laughs> and it's just marvellous. It's, it's an absolute, it's an absolute outlet and it's, it's just something, and when you get together with the guys when we're in the pub in Rotherham, um, just to watch them when, the when you have the match on the telly and then go up to Glasgow for the games. It's just, it's fabulous. It's one big, it's one big family. It's a happy family. And you're very, very rather see any people falling out with each other. And the amount of people that I've met through the years through Celtic, feel like Germany, um, or the UK, Ireland, good friends are built up there. Where my life watching Celtic is unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And even funnily enough, some opposition fans, not so much in Scotland that, but on the continent, you know what I mean? You can you can see guys and then they take a, a liking to Celtic or whatever. And then before you know it, they're all visiting Celtic and you might bump into them in, in a pub, whatever. It's, it's unbelievable. But I suppose it works otherwise because there's a lot of Celtic fans travel to like San Pauli and to Borussia Dortmund and uh, they just they just have a great time and it's a it's a, it's a great camaraderie. Is that the way I can best way to put it? Yeah. And then, and then meet, just meeting other people like you. You know what I mean? Yeah. That it's, it's, it's just it's fantastic and it's an outlet in life and all because sometimes life can be hard for everybody and don't I know it. So that's what it is. The mundane li way of life is just, as I say, it's hard and it's hard for everybody and there's so much going on in the world again. But we've always got with football. 
and long may it continue. Long may it continue, yeah. mate. Yeah, and that, like I've, I've said to people before, football fandom can be the biggest family to some people. We haven't got that loving family because we are, aren't we? Like we say, what we're doing this tonight, like yeah. we've met in the new inn in Rotherham before. All yeah. get to know each other clubs, and I'm sure one day me and you will experience that at Celtic Park along with Callum McGregor if he's watching, mate. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm sure him. Um, so, I was going to so say that. I'm, I'm up next week anyway for the game next week, so there's a few is going up. Paradise by name, and I'm sure it's paradise by nature as well. 100. percent Yeah. E- even when it's a even when it's a rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> It's, so, still, it's, still worth, it's still worth the trip. Yeah. Oh, so, it's always worth it. Yeah. So you mentioned there that you've done a lot of European trips. Is there any European trips that stick out to you as most memorable for whatever reason? Eh, well, there's been a few that big disappointments. and uh, But you know what? I don't know if it's just been a build-up over the years, but as I said earlier on there, the, a lot of the clubs the fans of certain clubs, they're so, they're so um, friendly. Obviously, you get problems. There's certain clubs with certain affiliations with stuff that we don't want to go into. And, uh, but see that, I'd say a lot of teams that, that have, that have uh, stadiums that have been here and played in cities in Europe, lots of them are, are absolutely genuine guys and they're generally the same as me and you. They love their team, they love their football, they love their rock and roll, and I, or whatever it is, and I booze, and they're happy with that. But unfortunately, you get some other clubs that are just are hell-bent and causing trouble. But, as I say, we've got that here in the UK as well, so there's nothing we can really do about that. But I would say probably... Um, I've, I've done Borussia Dortmund a couple of times, and I've also done it when Celtic have not been there, simply because um, you get to know guys and all that. And you know what? Do you know Germany, for the the way they run the, the Bundesliga, the way they treat the fans, it, it, it's absolutely fantastic. I know they can have problems now and again, but like when you buy a, a match day ticket, a match day ticket gives you free travel to the match. You Imagine, imagine doing that here. Oh, you beat me to it there, mate. <laughs> the, the, I mean, match day, match day travel comes with a ticket. It's absolutely fabulous. The prices are so good in, in Germany as well for the yeah. for the to get into the stadium. The, the, the season the season tickets are really really well priced, and it's why the Bundesliga is probably one of the best supported leagues in Europe. You know, they they treat the fans really really well. Also, the as I say, that the stadiums are selling. They're, they're all really good, and they're always welcoming as well. I've had some great times, even when they when we when they like Bayern Munich, Borussia Mönchengladbach, Borussia Dortmund. When they come to Glasgow, they're very very rarely any other trouble. I don't know how it is with Rangers when they play games, but I know it was a bit hectic a couple of weeks ago when they played Borussia Dortmund, but. On the whole, see if you're if you're all right with people, they'll be all right back to you. And if you sit and have a booze and nobody's been idiotic, it's amazing how people can then become friendly through yeah. football rather than the negativity all the time about it. You know, so yeah. but I, I'll tell you one of the best one of the best stadiums I've actually been to. I know everybody goes on about the camp now and all that, right? I tell you what, you know that um, Stade de Luz, that Benfica Stadium. It's Ooh, absolutely okay. fantastic. And you know, do you know what else is fantastic about it? The way they do it, they, there's a, obviously they're called the, the Super Eagles, aren't they? Well, they but there's a, a fella comes out and he's got a big uh, a big leather glove on and he comes out with an eagle. Sometimes they've got two and um, they, they, they tie the red and white ribbons around the eagle's talons, its feet, and it flies around the stadium and flies around and comes, comes back down and lands on the middle of the pitch. It's absolutely fantastic to see it. But I don't know how he does it, but but they have flown away before when it, when it was a uh, Lisbon derby, when they played sporting, when Benfica played sporting. There was that many fireworks that frightened the birds and they flew, they flew away. But they actually flew, they actually flew home 
believe it or not. But they went missing oh. because the, the noise and the, 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 the fireworks absolutely terrified them, which these birds have probably done this loads and loads of times, but one particular night they just thought, you know what, we're out of here. But it's a great sight to see that, and it's a fantastic stadium, and Lisbon's a great city anyway. But as I say, a lot of the other places I've been as well, as I say, I've done some of the smaller ones and all, but some of the grounds in, in Belgium and all that, I, they're absolutely fine and all, you know what I mean? As I say, if you, if you go with an attitude of, we're going to go here, have a laugh, have a few beers, blah, 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 it generally passes on the border. It's when people start going there and try to throw their weight about and being idiots, that's when you get the European police and other people want to get involved and cause trouble. But as I say, I've it's always been all right for me and I've always enjoyed it. But it's it's a great it's a great time and you cannot it's what you make it yourself. Yeah, it's what you make it. If you if people go for trouble and cause trouble, then it's all for them about. If you go with the attitude as when I lose we have a booze, then you are you're fine. Win or lose, you have a booze. I'll not forget that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, like you say there, though, mate, you've gone there with the right attitude, and that's probably why you've had so many great times over there. But you did just touch on there about Ajax before you started. Yeah. But what, what, what can you tell me about that episode? You you tell you what, you'd be better. You'd actually, be, you'd actually be better talking to Noel about that because I'd been previous, and uh, but oh, mate, they, they've got such a bad re reputation in Europe, and and do you know what it is as well? They're wanting to live up to it. To the bad mm. reputation. You know what I mean? I know there are certain clubs in England that have a bad reputation and they like to live up to it. Ajax, yeah. I'm not going to start naming names of English teams, but Ajax, they, they want to live up to this reputation that they've built their sale up the last 20 years. And you know what? It, it was never like that before. I don't know. I don't know where it's came for or whatever, because it was always a it was always a great club that was built on great football. You know, I mean, as a kid, when I used to see yep. Cruyff and Niskin and, and RM playing and magnificent, you know, uh, in the Dutch national side of the, the 70s, they were absolutely magical. The, the best team, uh, they were unfortunate that they, they got to two World Cup finals back to back and unfortunately they played the host nation twice in West Germany in 74 and then Argentina in 78. If they wouldn't have been playing the host nations, they'd have probably won it twice. Yeah. But as I say, Ajax, I don't know. I don't know what the fans are all about. I just don't. I don't understand what they're all about. They've turned into some sort of. It's as if they, they've got something to prove. I don't know. I don't understand it. Maybe ask one of them, and he'll tell you. Well, it's, it's a terrible shame because, like you say, they've always built themselves on having some fantastic teams over the years, and they have. They have. Are they four times European champions? Is it? They, they definitely won it a couple of times, most notably. Um, oh, yeah, they've, they've been they were brilliant. Oh, there was as I say, there was a spell where you go at Bayern Munich won it three times in a row, and then you had the Dutch yeah. sides winning it. Uh, Fiona beat the Celtic in the final in seventy, and then yeah. I think Ajax won it 72, 73, and then Bayern Munich won it 74, 75, 76. Because I remember when I was a school lad, and uh, I think it was a, was it a seventy six final. Maybe 75. It was running about that anyway. And um, Bayern Munich were playing St Etienne, who unfortunately are failing hard times in the last how many years? Because they were, um, they were, I'm not saying they were a Paris Saint Germain, a French football in the, the financial way, but they were arguably, them and Rennes, and Rennes were the, but the late 50s, early 60s, because they got beat three times in the European Cup final with Real Madrid, which must have been no main feat to get to the final three times. But when I grew up, St Etienne were arguably the French team and they played Bayern Munich you know, at Hamden. And I remember it because it was a terrible wet day and uh, I was in uh, Glasgow. And I was still at school at the time and we all went into town before the game just to see all the fans and all that. And it was a bit of a letdown because the weather was terrible and the final was at Hamden and it was a low, it was a low crowd for a European Cup final. I don't know if it was maybe Bayern didn't travel in numbers and the French, but they, they certainly they certainly brightened the place up and it was good to just to see two sets of foreign fans in, this, in the, the city. Um, 
but it, but that's what it's about, isn't it? Bringing bringing European games to to the moving them about Europe and seeing these clubs and seeing the fans coming for these finals. It's magical. But uh, let's hope that we can uh, see some more decent games in the next couple of seasons as well. Because hopefully if we if hopefully the Celtic win the Premier League this year, we'll uh, go straight into the Champions League group stages next season without the potential banana skins are playing like four qualifiers against teams for Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, who coincidentally isn't even in Europe, but that's another argument. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get to the, the final playoff and it's like, oh no, we've got to play Barcelona in a playoff game to qualify. It's unfair because they're finished third in their league of fourth. And we've won our league and then they go through and knock us out. I happened was a few years ago when we played the Arsenal. We got yeah. to the playoff game and uh, Arsenal done a number on us at Celtic Park. They went through and we went out. As it, it's unfair because I think if you're the champions of your league, you pay your money to UEFA, you should be entitled to play in the Champions League. I don't know what it's called, but I say money talks especially with UEFA and FIFA. It does, unfortunately, mate, yeah. They've, they've not been there for a while, have they? And we all, you know, we, we all know that teams like Celtic have a very, very special atmosphere on a European night. And uh, it's oh, sad it's, to not see it part of it. It's absolutely fabulous. It's sure you've been a part of it, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, also as well, see when you get clubs like, like Bayern Munich, and Manchester City and people like that who absolutely just want more, more, more tickets for Celtic Park to come to a Champions League night at Celtic Park. That's telling you everything. Because Man City, are, Man City, they're, they're doing superbly well. They've been doing well for a few years. They don't have a massive fan base no. and they don't particularly travel. But they when they were drawn Celtic, they just took all the tickets and they all come up to Manchester or wherever they live to, to see their team. But they all wanted to come to Celtic Park and it's yeah, the attraction yeah. of playing at Celtic, I think. Celtic sells itself, doesn't it? It's yeah. Worldwide. But what, so what, what do you think that. makes it so special at Celtic on a European night? I think it's... I think it goes back to the fact that they, they've done so well in Europe in the 60s, and then had a bit, quite a few success. Well, would you count success getting to the semi final and getting to another final and being in some semi finals and stuff like that? I mean, it wasn't it, last time we done it, it was a European Cup quarter final in 1980 against Real Madrid. And I, rem I remember that game pretty well, actually. Even when we played Juventus in the round before. Uh, other season before when we played Juventus. Um, Celtics just built up a history a European football and playing the game and going to places and winning, putting on a show. And people like me have told guys that's younger than me and guys older than me that have seen it. And it's just built up a history of Celtic in Europe. And even when Martin O'Neill came in and we went to the UEFA Cup final and 2003 and then the year later the quarter final but even though we financially it's against Celtic today we know that like it's against like will, will, will Club Bruges ever get to another European Cup final maybe no we've been in one before okay Liverpool beat them and, uh, at Wembley in 77 but the, these clubs always strive to the dream is, let's hope we can maybe get a team next year. And maybe David Ajax done a couple of seasons ago, get to the semi-final again, and then see how it goes. Every year, if you don't go in with that dream and you don't go in with that attitude, there's no point in being in the competition, is there? You always think it's like the FA Cup. You always think this this could be our year, this could be our year, you know? And that's the way it is. You just want that success. And you want, even, even though we've not won it, we've, we've took some big scalps over the years, and the group stages are qualified out of groups. Beating Barcelona, but listen, beating Manchester United, 
having two marvellous games with Man City five years ago, um, the three each game at Celtic Park was absolutely fantastic. Okay, the, the one at the Etihad wasn't so much, it was one each, but but the game, as I say, the game at Celtic Park, 3-3, three, three, marvellous, brilliant. And to play these teams and be, play Bayern Munich and the the big names in Europe. That's that's what Celtics are about. That's where they want to compete, and that's where they that's where we should be, and that's where we're hoping that big Angie Porter Kuglo gets his back to next season. Oh, fingers crossed, mate. But I've I've got to ask you about that Barcelona game in 2011. Were you there for that one by any chance? Was that the Tony Watt? Oh, well, when Tony Watt scored, yeah. Do you know what? I was working away then. <laughs> I was working away. And uh, we were watching it, me and a big pal of mine, we were watching it. And, uh, do you know, when Manyama got the first goal, yeah. he thought, oh, brilliant. And then when Tony Watt, when, it, when he ran, he came on at half time and he just nipped in for the right-hand side and he's put it right under Victor Valdez. Oh, my God, I thought, <laughs> I can't believe I've missed this tonight. And all the games I've been to, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Celtic games, some terrible ones, some right bad defeats, and uh, that night, oh my god! And I thought, you know, when we ended up hanging on, but listen, Barcelona were with Xavi, Iniesta, Messi, um, Gals, Pio, that they, they they were that was Barcelona because the team that they've got this season is in transition, but it doesn't last forever. But the the, the result. That, that night and the way they played they took it to Barca I mean and that's what makes Celtic especially in the European games they take it to teams and they want to win and the, the stadium 60,000 people turned up as Neil Lennon said in his uh, to the players before they went out he says listen you're playing Barcelona tonight he says there's 60,000 people out there they don't dream of playing for Barcelona they dream of playing for Celtic you go out and do it for them. And they did. Mm-hmm. And it was a highlight that, that particular night in that season. Absolutely fantastic. And that's right. and, and being a Celtic man, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Competing against these clubs. Absolutely. Playing against them and, and beating them. You know? And if you can beat that lot, because that was probably one of the best Barcelona teams ever, if not one of the best teams ever. That's what I just said there, but being yeah, Xavi absolutely. and Iniesta, Pio, um, Jordi Alba, uh, or them. And yet, before that, when we played them a few years before that, and we'd also beaten them at Celtic Park as well, when Alan Thompson scored, and that was a uh, Europa League game, and yep. we beat them one night at Celtic Park, and, we went to, we went, and to be fair, we went into the camp noon and got the result, so it's not to be sniffed at, and Ronaldinho was playing that night, and he missed a yep. penalty, like David Marshall saved it. You know what I mean? So... As I say, we've always managed to get the results and it's, and keep the flag flying for the Celtic in Europe. And that's the, that's what it's all about. Winning your league's absolutely great. Getting to the Scottish Cup final and winning the League Cup, aye. But to be in Europe competing against the best and being the best, that's what that's what Celtic was built on. Through the, through when, I mean, you can always look at it with Matt Busby, Bill Shankly and Jock Steen. They three men were visionaries before their time. Busby and Steen wanted European football. Let's play the best. And the, the clubs, Manchester United and Celtic, weren't they too particularly bothered? Especially the FAs, Scottish FA and English FA, weren't they that keen and um, oh, it'll disrupt the league? They said, no, let's get, let's get playing against these. Let's play these teams. Let's... Play in Europe and and show Europe how it's how we play the game, and they certainly did. Say like one in sixty seven, United one in sixty eight. So we showed the way. Oh, don't oh, do it, man! It took them a few years because the, the Latinos absolutely dominated that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's that's what it's all about: being the best and trying to get the best. Um, but you never know; the days might come back. They might know. But I actually think that Scottish football is on a bit of a a bit of a high at the minute, particularly the SPL. Um, crowds are up again, uh, and I know maybe it's a lot to do with people had a couple of years and no getting to the football and everything else. And 
but it's 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 a tight league this season, um, and it's there's two teams that's, that are in it, and we'll see how it pans out. There's eight league games to go, and it's in our hands. But for Posta Kuglo to come in as a manager, and you've got to hand it to the fella, yeah, it was absolutely left with a shambles last season when he came in. Even when he came in at the beginning of the season, there was twelve guys went out, and he was trying to bring guys in. He started the season with basically nobody. The first three games were a pretty much a disaster. And he went, I'm going to get the guys in before the transfer one day, blah, blah, blah. And he's brought in a, a load of players. And they've all, they've all gelled really well and they've turned in some great performances. OK, Europe has been a disaster this season, but nobody was looking to Europe. We only wanted to get back on playing in the league and winning consecutive in the league, getting players in, seeing how they bedded in. Because at the end of the day, when you when you join Celtic, you've got to hit the ground running. There's 60,000 people turning up there on a Saturday. And people say, you're only playing this, you're only playing that. Listen, it's not who you're playing against, it's who you're playing for. It's the club you're playing for. It doesn't matter who you're playing. Yeah. And you've got to go there and show the people and show them what you can do and send them away happy. And a lot of people, yeah. listen, some, some some great players have came to Celtic and other clubs in Scotland and failed miserably. And they've, 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 came, they've came with big reputations and it's no work for them. You know what I mean? So, we'll see what how it goes. about the badge that you wear there? It's all about, it's all, it's all about, it's all about the, 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 the shirt you pull on and, the, and that stadium and the people that turn up and, and worldwide there's people getting out of their beds at four in the morning to watch a dinner time game in, in Australia and in New York and filling, filling filling pubs up in Sydney and Perth and Boston and New York hundreds of people getting out of their beds at that time in the morning to go and watch Celtic on telly they're not doing that because they don't love the club <laughs> so they might um worldwide famous club and like you touched on there with the, the European Knights as well you look at why teams like Liverpool do so well in Europe it's because the atmosphere makes a massive difference I mean, we've touched on the Barcelona yeah. game there I wanted to touch on I think was it 2008 you beat a, a good AC Milan team at home as well do you remember that one where the yeah. fan ran up pitch celebrating he touched Dieter in face and he went down that yeah. game he wanted to win 2-1 the atmosphere yeah. makes such a massive difference the teams. Even when even when we even when we, we beat Man United in the when Arthur Boric saved Louis Sahar's penalty. Yes. Another, there's another I one, was yeah. At, I, was, I was at that one. I was also at the game at Old Trafford as well. And um oh when we scored when Nakamura took a free kick. Oh. But see when Arthur Boric saved the penalty. Oh my god, it was unbelievable. <laughs> and there's so many games that I could sit and talk all night about them. Even even when we when we beat Juventus as well, or, or even when when we went to Seville, when Graham Souness, when Blackburn Rovers were rolling, and Graham Souness threw it, take his Blackburn big money stars up to Celtic Park, go to a draw, ah, that was it. We'll do this, we'll do this. It was men against boys, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Graham, what happened at Ewood Park, mate? We done them. And then we done Liverpool as well at Anfield. You know, so it's, but then again, we had Henrik Larson, Hartson, Sutton, Stillian Petrov, Paul Lambert, Bobo Baldi, Johan Mialbe, Neil Lennon. It was an unbelievable side, an unbelievable side, an unbelievable good side that attacked. And Martin and Neil run a fabulous job. We hadn't done a treble since 1969, and his first season he came in. And we've done a treble, and Henry Larson scored 53 goals that season. No mean feat. I can always remember because that was the very first time that I, as a kid, so I was only, I'd have been eight years old at the time, as a Liverpool fan as well. I remember watching Celtic. I think I think the first, because my dad's obviously were telling me about Celtic Rangers as a kid. I can remember watching a game. I always remember Martin O'Neill was the Celtic manager, Alex, uh, Alex McLeish was the Rangers manager. I think. Yeah. I remember Celtic playing Rangers and you won 1 0. And I think it was John Hartson scored a header towards the end of the yeah. game. I can remember 
obviously Emmerich Larson was incredible back then. And I remember Liverpool, it was the UEFA Cup back Liverpool drawn Celtic and the UEFA Cup. Yeah. No, I've got Emmerich Larson playing against us then. I got what we're gonna do. I can remember yeah. I think it was the first minute Celtic got a corner. Whipped in, forced the last and one nil. Here we go. Here yeah. we go. We're going to get battered here, aren't we? And then Heskey and the scored thing, at one one. And, and the funny thing was, Henrik had been out for weeks with an injury, and we didn't think he was going to play that night. And then he <laughs> scored right away. But the game at Anfield, when when Alan Thompson took a free kick, it was an absolute screamer past Jersey Dudek, and then yeah. Big John Hartman scored a screamer at the at the Anfield Road end to give us the yeah. win. But you know, that that's what it's about. That's what I'm saying. The, 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 the Scottish clubs playing the English clubs I okay people got into that Battle of Britain stuff however just for the games they sell they're fabulous yeah they're fabulous games you know even the 1970 semi the 1970 European Cup semi-final say like Legion United the English press just their usual arrogance Legion United will do this and do that they're the best team in Europe. They're the best team in this and all that. All right, Celtic went to Ireland, wouldn't one one now, and then beat them two one at Hamden because they moved again for Celtic Park to Hamden. Celtic beat them two one, but that was probably a rain downfall and all because I think Celtic bought into the oh we've just beat the best team here. And they beat Leeds, knocked them out, and then we played Fear Nord in the final in the San Siro and they beat us two one in extra time. But that's football. That's the way it goes. Yeah. No, you're dead right about the English and Scottish clubs. Absolutely spectacle when they do come together. I mean, over the yeah. years, recently, well, not, not recently, but 10 years ago, I can remember there being a story about, you know, should Celtic and Rangers compete in the English league pyramid like some of the Welsh clubs do? I'm not too sure about it. I don't know what you think, but regardless I'm of that, do, do you think there should be maybe a UK sort of cup like a UK FA Cup or something that does involve well, the English and Scottish well, teams, do you think? They've, they've spoke about that before, making the, making the, the League Cup uh, one, putting the two, the two countries into the one cup. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, when they've tried it before, they, they've done it at a lower level. Do you know when they brought in the, the Anglo-English Cup and all that stuff or whatever it was called, and the Texaco Cup, you probably don't even remember that. They went down that road and they had the Anglo-Italian Cup. But I think now there's that much there's that much fixtures. Most of the big clubs are playing midweek weekend, midweek weekend. Where would you fit it in? To be yeah. honest, I think that if, if, the, if the English Premier League clubs probably could, they would probably drop out of the English League Cup. Or the ones that play in Europe would probably yeah. get a, a berth, you know. But the only thing with, it, with this, the Scottish clubs playing in the Scottish League Cup, we don't come in here till like the fourth round or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I don't think the timing would be good for that. I think they would. They would struggle to um, fix a congestion. Something else would need to give. So I don't see how it would work. I don't. I don't see. It would be. It'd be good if they took it seriously. But then again, what, what would they do? Stick it, stick the B team in under twenty ones, and then like like they've got that then over the, the mm. under twenty ones Premier teams in Scotland and England getting into the competition and the cups playing against the teams at the Championship and the First Division and that. I don't know. I think it takes away a wee bit for the for the smaller clubs that are looking to play one of the top league clubs in the competition. So that's why the, the Scottish FA Cup and the English FA Cup still has that bit about it because everybody's in and everybody wants to be in that. Whereas the League Cup final is lost a wee bit of its gloss until you get to the semi-final and then all of a sudden it just bursts into life, doesn't it? It does, mate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but like you say there, about the, it's... It's not good for fans, is it? If we, if, we, if we do a whole UK sort of cup thing, doesn't it? especially on a midweek. So um, I'm sure we'll find something. I mean, there was talk before COVID of a a proper summer club World Cup tournament. I don't know. I, I can't remember the detail. How they work it, but I can remember Liverpool and Real Madrid and 
through South American clubs being invited. So I mean that 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 could be potentially if they do go back to that uh, idea one day. Uh again, does it just become glorified friendlies? I think it. Yeah, does. that's the thing. It's like you know, Liverpool versus River Plate in a competitive game. It becomes that, doesn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah, I see. I mean, the the World Club Championship thing that they've got. I mean, when Celtic played in the final, they, they didn't like it was not like four clubs because the, the the Asian and the African clubs won the in it. It was just the winners of the European Cup played the winners of the Copa Libertadores, and that was that. This South American one, and racing in Argentina had won it and we'd won the European Cup and they played the game. And it turned into an absolute farce because it was just back to what I was saying an hour ago about the the fouling and the, the spitting and each other and the kicking and it just destroyed it and he ended up it was a draw and it was a draw at Hamden, it was a draw and Argentina and then they played the third game in Montevideo in Uruguay and um it, it just became a farce. Just became a farce. A battle. It just became a battle, and it, it's what it is. It's even that. It's even in Celtic folklore that there was a song written about it, which you've probably heard me sing before. <laughs> cha cha cha. <laughs> <laughs> so right. So uh, I'll be finishing up there because I need to go and I've got a couple Sorry, of things. Yeah. Um, so couple last of question. Things. Last yeah. question. We always ask people. Could you sum up Celtic in three words? What would it be and why? Yes, I could sum it up in three words. It could be a three-word phrase or it could be... Or just three yeah. words separately. A great club for everyone. <laughs> Simple as that, mate. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. There's no man's judge being creed or colour or nationality at our place. As long as you want to come and watch us and or play for a team, you're more than welcome. That's what it's all about. And that was that's what the foundations of the club was built on. It wasn't just built for a certain nationality or a certain religion. It was built on to help a certain people, a certain faith. But it was always open to everybody. Anybody was welcome to come, and that's and that was why it was called Celtic, the Celts, rather than Glasgow Hibernian. And that's it. And we're still here all these years, unbroken, and unbowed. You know what some other clubs that try to tell us that they're 150 year old fibbles. <laughs> nah, man, fantastic and. A massive thank you for tonight for coming on. It's been absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed this, and uh, I'm sure one day we can both experience it together at Celtic Park along with some other people. I'm looking forward to that day. Aye, aye, absolutely, kid. No, no problem. No, see you soon. Okay. Yeah. Great, mate. Thank you very much. I'll see you again soon. Bye, see you, mate. Yep. Bye. Bye, bye.